Today we have a great uh, uh, panel to start uh, us off uh, in this rainy morning. We start with uh, David MacDonald, uh, pros professor in political science at the University of Guelph. And uh, he's going to be talking uh, uh, on complex sovereignties, indigenous peoples, digital <coughs> technology, and the national security uh, set by states. And, and, and we speak about 15 minutes, and so then we have more, uh, also time at the end for discussion. Okay, great. Thanks, Rama. Um, and thank you very much for everyone who's organized the conference. Oh, Elsa and everybody else. And um, so just thanks also to, uh, to Shirk, the, our funding body, and uh, also to uh, Jackie and Catherine who uh, helped me out with some of the research uh, for some aspects of this. So very much appreciated. Uh, Cheryl was talking about yesterday about uh, in some ways uh, being the product of borders, uh, as, as we all are. Um, so I thought I'd just start off by talking about my own uh, uh, past, which is very much based on borders, but also very much imperial borders, which is something we haven't really looked at very much. Um, so my mom is from Trinidad. Uh, originally the family was brought over from India when it was under <coughs> British rule, to Trinidad, which was under British rule, to cut sugar cane after the slaves, uh, enslaved Africans who were under British rule were emancipated. Um, missionaries uh, from Canada came to Trinidad and converted my mom's side of the family uh, from Hinduism and Islam. And, uh, and then many of them moved to Canada to go to a Lutheran uh, boarding school uh, to get an education because a missionary from India who had been converted in Canada um, decided that that would be a good idea for them to do. My dad's family is white from Nova Scotia and, uh, and, and so they were also part of a a British imperial system. Both my parents were, uh, one was born in Canada, the other in Trinidad, but both at a time when they were both born with uh, as British citizens and British subjects. And uh, when we look at issues of surveillance, intelligence sharing, and things like that, I think of the Five Eyes defense relationship um, and, uh, and many of the other things uh, within the so-called Anglosphere. I think of the Kansas states as well, uh, who voted against the Declaration. Uh, it's, it's interesting that imperial borders are also very important. Uh, and so when we talk about the borders uh, between individual states, uh, I'm also kind of interested in those borders uh, that are legacies of, of an imperial present, uh, because they seem to determine a lot of the way uh, intelligence is shared, certainly when we're looking at issues of surveillance. Uh, it's the remnants of the British Empire. Those countries are the ones that seem to trust each other the most. And so we have kind of forms of uh, transnational whiteness, uh, which, uh, which pervade uh, many of the ways in which we think about borders and boundaries uh, in terms of who, who states trust and who they don't uh, is often quite racialized. So these are some of the issues that I want to talk about briefly today. Um, not to be necessarily pessimistic, although I will be to a certain extent, but I'm also interested in the potential emancipatory aspects of some of the new technologies. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to look at that a little bit today as well. Uh, some of the work I've used looks at the work of uh, sociologist Zygmunt Bauman. And Bauman has talked a lot in his work about the development of the Western uh, nation state and how uh, borders and boundaries, of course, produce both insides and outsides, uh, what you might call friends and enemies, uh, but also produces the figure of the stranger. And the stranger is someone who doesn't fit neatly into the insides or the outsides. Um, and I've discussed in some of my work the concept of how indigenous peoples have become estranged as settler states have built up around them. Uh, and so that becomes something quite interesting to consider. Um, the process of estrangement means that uh, people from another country uh, with different cultures and attitudes uh, go in and take over the lands of somebody else. And as Patrick Wolfe discusses, that there's a logic of destruction and also replacement. So the trees, lakes, boundaries, everything that indigenous peoples uh, knew and, 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 and named become renamed and, and changed in different ways. I've spent quite a bit of time in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and one of the things that strikes me as strange is that the British introduced a lot of deciduous trees in which they invented essentially autumn, uh, where before there weren't many trees, but now you have this idea of autumn leaves falling, which is a kind of a British contrivance, and also introduced various mammals. So the whole uh, ecosystem and even the concept of seasons changes with settler colonialism. Um, again, within a kind of an imperial network. Um, and again, that imperial network remains salient in security terms and intelligence terms, but also in ideationally in the way that uh, settler states act as a group uh, to, uh, to block many uh, indigenous initiatives. So I think that that's something that perhaps we can talk about a bit later. Uh, 
I also started reading up on passports because I was very interested in the issue of passports. And uh, John Torpy has written an illuminated, uh, illuminating book on passports, uh, in which he argues that uh, the role of passports and other documentation is for states to gain the monopoly of the legitimate means of movement. Uh, and this becomes a, a way of depriving people of the freedom to move across certain spaces and render them dependent on states and the state system for the authorization to do so. In other words, states uh, create documentation uh, in order to make it people have to have an identity from which they can escape only with difficulty. There's a fundamentally distrustful nature uh, to this process, as Torpy's argued, in that passports and identity documents reveal a massive illiberality, <coughs> a presumption of their bearer's guilt when called upon to identify themselves. The use of such documents by states indicates their fundamental suspicion that people will lie when asked who or what they are, and that some independent means of confirming these matters must be available if states are to sustain themselves as going concerns. In other words, the state gets to decide who you are and gets to securitize your identity and ask for certain kinds of documentation which only it uh, agrees are legitimate or, or illegitimate. The question of surveillance then kind of pops up in, in some of this, uh, this work here. Maybe I'll pop back here for a second. Uh, because we see that there's certainly uh, in, in many uh, indigenous movements, there's a great deal of surveillance, especially in Canada. Uh, Craig Prue has noted that potential insurgents, terrorists, and criminals collectively or individually threatening the security of the Canadian uh, oligarchic state are often tied to indigenous peoples and indigenous movements. Uh, and a recent book by Crosby and Monaghan highlights a consistent pattern of police surveillance of indigenous movements, intimidation, and violence. Uh, when people are challenging the Northern Gateway pipelines, shell fracking in British Columbia and New Brunswick, federal attacks on traditional governments at Barrier Lake, and ways that participants in the Idle No More movement are also targeted. So there's quite a large a growing literature on the issue of surveillance and how uh, when we're posting things on Facebook or social media, things like that, uh, to, uh, for, for different kinds of, of organization, that stuff is being monitored, uh, data is being sold and held in different ways. I'm not going to really talk much at all about um, some of the issues that my colleagues are going to talk about in terms of passports and things like that. Uh, but what interests me also are the uh, borders and boundaries within settler states themselves, uh, especially in the case of Canada, uh, where you consider that uh, there are about 3,100 um, reserves, First Nations reserves, uh, and about 600 First Nations governments, but the, that land comprises only 0.2% uh, of the total land mass of Canada. 90% is still uh, controlled by the provincial and federal crown. And so the purpose of, of borders and boundaries, even within a settler state, uh, is also to try to control the movement of indigenous people. And, uh, and this is just a, a picture of, of where, near where I live uh, at Six Nations. Uh, and the Holdenman Tract, of course, doesn't represent uh, any sort of traditional lands necessarily, but what it does represent was land that was promised to, uh, to, to Six Nations. And, uh, and the current bit that you can see in red only represents about 45% of, uh, of that Alderman tract land, which encompasses much of the city of Kitchener, Waterloo, and other, other surrounding areas. So, uh, so this becomes, I think, an interesting issue. Uh, I'm going to move beyond that. I just wanted to look quickly at the idea of, uh, of indigenous sovereignty. And uh, there's a lot of interesting work being done in this area. Uh, Jennifer uh, Wemigwans recently uh, did a book called Digital Bundles, uh, in which she says that there's a general feeling that if indigenous peoples do not claim, uh, stake a claim out on the internet, they will become colonized in that space too because of their absence. Uh, the oh. Are we good? Okay. Uh, she also worries uh, of indigenous peoples becoming what she calls roadkill on the information superhighway. So that's a curious term. Um, Winter and Boudreaux in a recent intervention also uh, used the, the concept of the trickster to talk about the internet. It has the potential for promoting indigenous self-determination but could also undermine it and probably both at the same time. And I think the trickster idea image is, is probably a useful one in thinking about uh, the role of some of these technologies because we don't really know who controls them and there are things that may look emancipatory but they may also be uh, quite destructive at the same time. Um, and uh, uh, Rahea has talked also about what she calls the virtual res uh, reservation uh, with a variety of different elements. I have no idea how I'm doing for time, so um, I might just move on uh, from a little bit of that. Uh, 
but she, she goes into three different aspects of what she calls a virtual reservation, which has to do with the realm of the filmic as a field uh, into which alternative visions of the world can be projected. Second is a meeting place for tribal intellectuals and scholars to workshop, debate, and define new projects. And third is a network of computer-assisted trans transnational indigenous communities who exchange and create information. And in time, I suppose, we may see on the internet something akin to an indigenous Facebook, which is not commercialized, but some, some form where people can be more interlinked together uh, and share stories without, uh, uh, without being, being monitored uh, the way that things have been going on uh, currently. So these, I just also looked at some different <coughs> things. And then I'm going to talk about something which I don't fully understand, which is blockchain. So if any of you understand it better than me, you can, uh, you can enlighten me during the break uh, or after. But uh, there's a lot of very interesting work that's, uh, that's being done uh, looking at, uh, uh, at the role of different kinds of technologies. Uh, so many uh, traditional lands are demarcated with online maps and with GPS. Uh, vehicles with appropriate electronics can identify when one is going on to traditional indigenous lands. Layers of mapping can allow us to better understand when we are entering indigenous lands and what are the appropriate ways to understand <coughs> of that space. Uh, and there's other, other people like GPS technologies are uh, allowing people to, to cite, as you can see here, trees with uh, cultural significance. And so you can monitor things uh, in, in real time using a variety of, of instruments and, and map this sort of thing as well. Uh, the uh, Enimiki uh, Indigenous Technology Group, uh, based in British Columbia, has been doing a lot of work on data sovereignty uh, for Indigenous uh, uh, nations as well. So they're doing some interesting work. And then Dallas Hunt uh, uh, talked recently of a, of a project here uh, called the Pipelines uh, Collective, which kind of looked at remapping uh, or counter-mapping uh, the city of Edmonton and other places. So showing what, uh, what lands look like before colonization and after, but also what uh, the encroaching colonization of Edmonton did and how it sort of, it sort of took over uh, a reserve that was set up by, by the settler state. Uh, and, uh, and so it just looks at different configurations of power. Another thing which I was talking to Bina about uh, massacres and, uh, and, and different forms of genocide, because I work a lot on genocide, this is a, a recent project that took place uh, at the Cambodia Documentation Center in which people are interviewed and, uh, and then you can go in remotely and enter in data uh, about sites of massacres and things like that. And then that can be, that can be uh, entered in locally in different places and then at a national or international level you can then begin to, uh, to document uh, these sorts of things. So there's, there's a tremendous scope for using different kinds of uh, geographic information systems and uh, uh, GPS systems to, to actually document uh, different kinds of, of maps, indigenous maps of various kinds, massacre maps of various kinds, traditional lands, resources, uh, sites of significance, things like that, uh, which we will probably see more and more uh, available in apps and different things like that. I'm not really going to have time to look at the details of blockchain. I'm just going to put up this little slide. Essentially what blockchain is, it's a way of, of storing information. What's that? Oh, oh okay. Uh, well, it's it's the basis of Bitcoin and a lot of other crypto technologies. Uh, and what it is, it's it's a way that you can you can share information in a long chain, uh, and it's it's very decentralized. Um, anyway, I'm kind of running out of time to discuss the details of it, but this is kind of a little thing which shows you a bit. Basically, everybody uh, in a blockchain are a user, and they would. They have one one transaction on this chain, and uh, and this record is is downloaded to every user within a blockchain, which might be several hundred or, or more people. Uh, you have to have a really powerful computer because one chain of transactions uh, is about 120 gigabytes. So I mean, I suppose I could store about eight on here, uh, which which is not a lot, right? Um, so there's a lot of opportunities. Um, and, uh, and the concept of Mazacoin was introduced uh, by the uh, Oglala Lakota Nation. Well, it wasn't adopted by them. Uh, there was a man called Paiu Harris who was interested in doing uh, a kind of a, a currency for the nation, uh, which would raise money but also kind of provide a certain uh, way of, of, uh, of kind of emancipating uh, control of the money supply. 
and uh, allow local businesses to be able to uh, to cater better to people. So it's a, it's a more decentralized system. Uh, it's apparently more transparent, uh, and it didn't it wasn't adopted in this case for some reasons that I can explain later. Partly because the the point of these cryptocurrencies is that they're not centrally controlled, but um, but Harris's idea was that the uh, the, the local government, the tribal government, would, would in fact be in control of the currency, which would be a bit of a problem because he then wanted to sell the currency and trade it with other currencies, which would then also reduce the, the, the control that the, that the local government would have over the currency. So it was, it was kind of interesting. Uh, other things have been suggested as well, like community policy making in real time, uh, e-voting, which Brian is going to talk about later, and then something called BitNation. And this was designed for... Um, uh, people who are stateless uh, after the, uh, the the refugee uh, situation in Europe, and about 15,000 people join BitNation. They get a kind of digitalized identity, uh, which allows them to be connected to other people who are stateless. But all, they also have a form of electronic documentation that's independent of states, uh, and so that creates some very interesting kinds of opportunities as well. Um, this is another example of blockchain. Uh, which is, uh, is called Inuk, e it's in the north, um, and uh, in the town of uh, Rigolet. Mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, and this is something actually that the University of Guelph is working with as well. It's, uh, it's for people to remotely uh, document uh, uh, different uh, climate change uh, problems, uh, and that's uploaded to a central uh, computer through an app. Uh, there's also something called Right Mesh because the internet is very bad there, so people buy and sell through tokens access uh, through their phones to the internet uh, and this this process which is facilitated through blockchain allows people to use the internet and also upload data uh, in the community about uh, about different climate change issues and how what kinds of effects they're seeing. I'm just going to end very soon obviously but some of the problems of uh, blockchain first of all uh, Bitcoin which is the largest blockchain cryptocurrency uh, it used it used more power in 19, uh, 2017 than the whole of Switzerland. So the amount of energy that you need to run these programs is, is pretty crazy. That's a Bitcoin miner there, which is like, basically to process these transactions takes a huge amount of electricity and computing power, which raises the question of the digital divide because as has you know, been demonstrated statistically, uh, urban areas in Canada uh, versus northern communities and many indigenous communities, urban areas have much better access to quicker internet. So there's, there's that aspect as well. And there's something called the 51% attack, which means that this stuff is more secure than banks and things like that in some ways, but can still be subject to different kinds of an attack. Right, so what sort of conclusions would, would I make? Um, first, that there's considerable potential with the internet, um, but also pitfalls and problems with blockchain and everything else. Um, and uh, also, I think that there's poten potential in good ways, but also this process could, could easily be hijacked by, by various governments and security agencies as well. And the digital divide as such remains, remains a challenge. Um, so that's something that needs to be, to be sorted out. So I guess if you wanted to use the, the imagery of the trickster again to return to that, uh, there are positives and negatives. Uh, and uh, it's difficult sometimes to tell which is which because they sort of all work together simultaneously. So um, I'll leave it at that. Hopefully stuck more or less within my time. And, maybe touch on some themes that, uh, that might be of, of interest to people during the discussion. So, thank you. Thank you, David, uh, for very, um, very interesting and eye-opening talk, like uh, uh, expanding our thinking about borders also to the online. Like, I think that's something that we do need to think about um, and discuss further and, and like include in our conversations about boundaries and, and the potentials and challenges. So, uh, so we can discuss that more. The uh, next uh, speaker is uh, Howard Thompson. Um, uh, he is a Mohawk traditional chief with the title of uh, Onerekoa, Big Eagle, um, appointed by the women of the Wolf Clan in 2007. He lives in Akasasne on the Canada-US border. He is the co-chairman of the Haudenosaunee External Relations Committee and very active in various, uh, various issues such as climate change, traditional knowledge and border crossing. 
Haudenosaunee is also known as the Six Nations Iroquois Confederacy, consisting uh, of the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, and Tuscarora nations. He is a fluent Mohawk speaker and participates in many traditional ceremonies and political meetings. He carries with him the knowledge of things to come through uh, the prophecies. So, um, uh, and your, your talk um, is titled The Challenges of Living on an International Border. So I'm going to give a little bit of history first, trying to keep everything brief because uh, a lot of our history stories take days to uh, recite, so I don't think you guys want to sit here for days. Um, we started out with our, um, I'm going to call these um, divine interventions that the uh, Creator has given us. Um, over 2,000 years ago, He gave us our ceremonies because uh, the Creator looked down on us and to see, uh, and He said we need something. So He gave us the, the ability to be able to give thanks to the Creator for all that, all that He has given us. So we have ceremonies that we do today that uh, exist from over 2,000 years ago. And then uh, later on, about a thousand years later, he looked down on us again, and he said they need some kind of governance, something to um, um, for the people to uh, follow. So um, he gave us uh, the great law of peace, and that was say like a thousand years ago. And uh, as uh, Betty had mentioned yesterday, that uh, the chiefs uh, he created the system of chiefs, and. Uh, they, they are put in by the women of the, the clan. So the, the chiefs are answer, answer to, the, to the women. So uh, when did the women get the vote in this country? And so we've had uh, the, the women's equal footing with the men for over a thousand years. So, but um, that changed a little bit oh, because of the colonization that changed the attitude of the men towards women. But hopefully we, st we still got enough of that, that tradition to keep the, the men in line and be respectful of the women. And then after the formation, then we have uh, our brothers from across the ocean that decided to come and vi pay us a visit. So what happened was there was um, the doctrine of discovery. The, the Pope decided to say that at the time, he says, if you find people in those foreign lands that you're gonna you're gonna go to, and they don't uh, they are, they're not Christians, then you have the right to their property. So you have the right to take over whatever whatever they are on. So that was a that was a declaration by the Pope at the time. So saying that you have the rights to their land. And um, you have to convert them, come up, convert them over to Christianity. So that happened in the uh, 1400s, I believe. And then what happened uh, is uh, because of all this change that was coming to our world of indigenous people on, on Turtle Island, we were given the, um, I call it things to come. So that's another four-day recital there of all the things that we were given. We were given uh, um, the ceremonies that were given a thousand, um, two thousand years ago. We were kind of altered over the years, but through this um, uh, message, they were, um, it was all put back on track. And some of the things that uh, this was given to us in 1799, and imagine being told in 1799 that the day will come when there will be horseless carriages. Horseless carriages. And what do we call that today? Vehicles, cars, or, or whatever. But it was told to us that your people are going to like it, these horseless carriages, and it's going to send a lot of people home, meaning back to the Creator's land. Because right now, I believe the statistic says that automobiles is still the number one killer in the world. So it was told to us that it was going to send, send a lot of people home, and, and then there's um, um, uh, 
these uh, ships that were going to be flying in the air. Imagine being told in 1799 that you're going to see ships flying in the air. It's uh, almost unbelievable. So that, oh, that prophecies that we were given for a four-day recital's worth almost kept everything small because they were so unbelievable to be to spread it out. Because when we were first given the message, uh, um, uh, Handsome Lake was the person that, it, that received the message. And he went to Washington, D.C. to give them the message. And that's, that's where it stopped. So we, um, we had the intention of uh, passing on the message from the, of things to come. So, and then as things moved on, um, the, Dutch, the Dutch came over, one of the first ones to cross, cross the ocean. And um, they were starting to move into our backyards. And so it said, we said to ourselves, the Haudenosaunee, it doesn't look like they're going to leave. So we says, well, let's, let's sit down and have an agreement. So we sat down with them and had an agreement. We call it the two-row wampum. And we, our agreement is, um, we will travel in our canoe and you will travel in your ship and we will go down the river of life in parallel we won't impose our laws on you and you won't impose your laws on us so we will go down the river of life together so that's what we've always believed in even, even today with the United States and with Canada. Don't impose laws on us and we won't impose our laws on you. So I came around to them ignoring those uh, principles. So in 1924, um, this guy in a small group decided that because the, as Elsa kind of introduced yesterday of this guy and uh, how um, um, the imposition of Canada was making uh, themselves onto um, one of our communities, Six Nations. So when, they don't, when they're not reasonable, when they don't want to talk, then we go above their heads. Then we went to the League of Nations in 1924. This guy went there and, uh, and when he got there, they wouldn't let him cross the street, even to the same side of the League of Nations at the time. So they wouldn't let him do that. So the mayor, the mayor, took um, took interest in his uh, plight and uh, took him under his wing, and they got to know each other very well. And the mayor had this little boy, and this little boy came very interested in the in the chief, this guy. So they got to know each other very well. And then, so that always happened as that trip went there and. Um, and this guy went home, and then Alsa mentioned the challenges he he, had, he went through when he got home. He wasn't able to uh, reside in Canada; had to reside across the across the river and reside in um, Lewiston, the uh, Tuscarora Reservation. So, and that's where he ended up passing away. He never got he never got home from his trip to uh, uh, Geneva, the League of Nations. So as time passed, no, but just before I move on, something else happened in 1924. They, the United States decided, hey, here's an idea. Let's uh, make all the indigenous people in the United States U.S. citizens. So that passed in Congress. Let's, let's make all the uh, indigenous people, the natives of, uh, um, in the U.S., citizens. But the Haudenosaunee responded and we said, we made a letter saying and we sent it to Washington, thanks but no thanks. So we've maintained our own identity up to, up to then, up to now. So as things moved on, so in 1977, uh, Canada and the U.S. were still encroaching on, uh, on Haudenosaunee uh, in different ways, trying to 
uh, give us. In 1924, they did manage to give the Six Nations Reservation the elective system. They took, they pushed aside the traditional, traditional system and brought in the elective system and the answer to Canada. So that was the beginning of uh, things, to, to, things to change in our, in our communities. Later on, where I come from is Akwazasana. And um, uh, Akwazasana is in uh, Ontario, it's in Quebec, it's in New York State. Um, maybe I can step back a little bit and uh, when Canada and the U.S. decided to make each other countries and they, went, they wanted to put a border across the country. So what they did for us, or in our area, was from Kingston, Ontario. And Kingston was kind of like the mouth of Lake Ontario and then there's a river, St. Lawrence. So what they decided to do was throw a log in the river and let that log drift down. And as that log was drifting down, that was the U.S. Canadian, U.S. and 2006 or 2007, I'm not positive on my year, the U.N. Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was adopted. And just think of that, that adventure that uh, we took, <coughs> put all the Haudenosaunee, not the no, no, excuse me, not the Haudenosaunee, but all the indigenous people of the world on the map. It gave them an avenue to be able to uh, uh, voice, voice their concerns from their own individual state that they come from. So now we, we regularly have the UN permanent forum sessions so that indigenous people can come there and have a place to voice their concerns from their own state. So that was um, that's the, that was the challenges that um, we've had living on the border. Um, we have daily challenges because as uh, we have family, I have family in New York State, in Quebec, and in, in Ontario, and to see family, you have to go through a, a border crossing. But in in our plight for being able to get our voice out there in the world. We wouldn't declare ourselves Canadian or U.S. citizens. So we wouldn't do that. We are Haudenosaunee and I am Mohawk. And nobody is going to tell me any different. So me and uh, Cheryl here are going to tag team now on um, explaining our Haudenosaunee passport. I'll, I'll let Cheryl introduce it, and then, um, and then I will put the life, uh, the reality beyond beyond that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Howard. Uh, I, I think we could listen to you at least a day <laughs> easily. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for sharing those, the history of, and, and put, put, put things into perspective, and those stories as well. I think it like, makes it so much more relevant uh, and, and, and real for us to understand um, and, and comprehend the challenges, like we talk about the challenges of farmers, but also kind of the historical stories that are behind those events. So thank you so much. Uh, uh, the third speaker on our panel is, uh, as Howard already mentioned, uh, uh, Sharon Lightfoot, uh, professor uh, uh, of political science in indigenous, uh, uh, sorry, professor of political science at the University of British Columbia, and Anishinaabe uh, from. Uh, you mentioned that yesterday, and now, like, how well do I remember this? <laughs> Lake Superior. Great. Yeah, Lake Superior. So. Uh, and you're going to continue on the same topic, so please. Thank you, Rana. And before I continue, um, Rana was speaking in her opening remarks about her work, and she's too humble to do it, so I'm going to do it for her. Um, her work 
uh, that she was talking about that is bringing together in terms of self-determination, governance, and gender is an incredible piece. It's just published this year from Oxford Uni University Press. It, has, it, was, it represents a tremendous body of research of uh, first-hand interviews with indigenous women across Greenland and Canada and Sami. And if you haven't read it, please look it up and get it. It's a tremendous book. And it, it, it demonstrates how gender must be considered in self-determination struggles. And I think it is a crucial intervention at a very important time. So, like I said, she's too humble to mention it. I just did it for her. <laughs> I had the opportunity to read it before it was even published and then do a, a intro panel at our conference, our major disciplinary conference in March, and it is just phenomenal. So look it up, check it out, it's tremendous. Uh, I do this paper with a great deal of humility and with deepest respect. Um, I am not Haudenosaunee, as I have mentioned, I'm Anishinaabe, so I approach this work on the passports as an outsider, but as a friend and a neighbor, and um, with, again, deepest respect for my friends and colleagues. Uh, and I do that because despite a few other isolated cases of indigenous peoples getting the idea later to develop and use their own passports, the Haudenosaunee have done it continuously and without taking US or Canadian passports along the way. And so it's a, it's a case of incredibly strong self-determination and resilience in the face of huge challenges, which Howard will also articulate. And despite, I mentioned my brother-in-law yesterday who will not take a US passport um, because he wants to assert his treaty rights, so he'll only carry his tribal ID card and assert that he has the right to cross into Canada, which he's only successfully done once or twice because he ends up uh, caught at the border. And, but, I, I, again, I have deepest respect for that because he keeps trying and he keeps advocating and he will not back down. And so I respect that. But he hasn't yet tried to extend that to other lands beyond Canada. So that's part of uh, his lived reality is that he won't travel somewhere else because that would mean taking a US passport, which he won't do. Now, the, my work on passports is definitely an academic piece, but I'm unique because I call myself an accidental academic. There was no reason in the world that I should be doing this job right now. It was never in my life plan and it was never, um, what I thought was my fate. But life happens to you while you're making other plans, in the words of John Lennon. So <laughs> by a bunch of unexpected twists of fate, here I am as a scholar, uh, indigenous scholar of international relations. But I approach my work always with a community-based perspective and always with an indigenous rights focus. So when I take a look at Haudenosaunee passports and the use of them, I'm trying to put that into terms that are disrupting international relations as we understand it. And so I want to highlight what this case does and why the discipline of international relations should be paying attention. Because it makes an important intervention at a crucial time. Now, this is a paper I've been working on for a very long time. And I say that because one of the people that was one of my key informants on this paper is actually um, Betty's relative, who's no longer with us, Tanya Kritcher. And so that tells you how long I've been working on this. It's about 2010, 2011. I've tried several times to publish it in international relations journals, and it is uh, rejected consistently. So maybe this is the opportunity to finally get it into print. Uh, so uh, this is my this is my hope. <laughs> um, I, they tell me uh, I, I published it several times. And I've been told by international relations journals that it's not an academic piece, it's an editorial. Oh. And uh, that it, it's not based on uh, empirical research, which I strongly dispute. But <laughs> we'll take that uh, and we'll show them eventually. So there's, there are three questions that I look at in the paper and address. The first is, of course, and, and this is a larger <coughs> question that indigenous rights uh, take up, is 
What exactly is the meaning of self-determination in international law and practice? And how has indigenous rights and the UN Declaration challenged and shifted and pushed for a more expanded global meaning of self-determination beyond what we have previously used? And then I look in particular at how the Haudenosaunee passport use as one of the strongest claims on the planet of indigenous self-determination what does that reveal to us about understandings of self-determination, sovereignty, and citizenship, and how that can be expanded and, and made more complex? And so um, I'm going to defer to Chief Howard later to elaborate on some of those histories, so I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on that this morning. And then finally, what are some conclusions and implications about indigenous self-determination and self-determination more broadly beyond indigenous people that we can learn from the Haudenosaunee. So I think uh, in the interest of time, I won't spend a great deal of my uh, minutes this morning talking about self-determination, other than to say it's always been subject to assertions and negotiations. And while it's a legal human right, it also serves and a principle of international law, it is subject to interpretation. So, in the decades from 1948 and following, self-determination was largely interpreted as a decolonial project, uh, giving statehood to previously colonized peoples. And it was understood as state-centric and rooted in the Westphalian system. So it was bounded uh, in terms of who was eligible under the, the uh, saltwater thesis or the blue water thesis. And under those articulations, which said that only overseas people were eligible for decolonization, it did create a two-tiered system of self-determination where indigenous peoples had a second-rate right of self-determination under international law. Now, the UN Declaration, of course, has pushed for uh, a corrective on that discriminatory exclusion and that indigenous peoples are entitled to an equal right of self-determination as all other peoples. The question is uh, the complexities of how that has come to be, because a state-centric vision of self-determination is quite simple. You, you create a state, or you join with a state, and there's a moment of referendum or a moment of decision, and then the territory becomes self-determining. With indigenous peoples, it's far more complicated. And um, some indigenous peoples wish to exercise maximal self-determination without the full trappings of the statehood structure that would, would be required if we are oversimplistic about what self-determination means. So indigenous peoples are pushing for something bigger, broader, more complex, more nuanced, maybe more plural. And that's where I think the Haudenosaunee passport case becomes very instructive. So by using this passport, and again, we have to stress the consistency of asserting this strong claim of self-determination. And Haudenosaunee don't just assert this with the passport, but the passport is one clear instance of a very complex and assertive self-determination. And as my friends have talked about, the origin of this use really lies back in the 1920s with Descahe. And uh, even though there's many, many instances of, of back and forth across the border, the moment that Descahe traveled to Geneva, and we didn't use passports in those days, it was travel papers, but he traveled representing Haudenosaunee, and on Haudenosaunee travel papers, not US or Canada, since he was speaking against them. It made no sense to go on their travel papers, and it made only perfect sense to travel on Haudenosaunee travel papers. So he set the tone initially. Then the delegation in 1977 had the same logic. We're not going representing Canada or the United States. We're going to speak against them. Therefore, we're going to travel on Haudenosaunee documents. And that's when they developed uh, what we would come to call now as a passport. And the passport has actually, and I think here's the key of the story, because there have been a couple cases highlighted in the media and the, the 2010 one of the lacrosse team that didn't, have such an easy time with the passport is the most well-known one. But the real story here, as far as I can see it, is that actually the passport works. 
more often than not. <laughs> uh, Chief Warren Lyons has been using the passport since a trip to Geneva in 1977, routinely. He's traveled extensively on his passport to numerous conferences, diplomatic meetings. Mohawk advocate Kenneth Deer, who sat with me and talked about his use of the passport, he has traveled to over 20 countries on his Haudenosaunee passport. U.S., Canada, U.K., Switzerland, Japan, Mexico, Denmark, South Africa, Venezuela. He gave me the entire list. He listed off all 20 of them. Now, the security atmosphere following 9-11 has complicated this, of course. Uh, and so beginning in 2007, and maybe Howard will talk about this, uh, there's been work to bring the passports up to more technical specifications with very expensive equipment. Uh, however, the, the tenacity and the desire to travel on the passports has remained consistent. And uh, I think one of the key points to bring out is in that famous 2010 case over the lacrosse team that eventually did not travel because they could not be assured of re-entry on their Haudenosaunee passports. What I found most interesting about that, and while there were a great deal of media commentaries and stories on it, during the controversy and the international press flurry, Kenneth Deere was in Geneva on his Haudenosaunee passport with his Swiss visa in his passport. And he was giving a telephone interview to CBC Radio from Geneva about the passport, talking about the lacrosse team. And he said, we travel on our Haudenosaunee passports because we're Haudenosaunee. The Iroquois Nationals lacrosse team is not representing Canada or the US. In fact, they go there to play against Canada and the US. But there he was giving a CBC radio interview in Geneva, sitting on his uh, Haudenosaunee passport. So the key is, not that the passport doesn't work, but how often it does. Um, and again, that's what I'm trying to draw out here. And then um, the New York Times characterized the entire lacrosse team situation as a defeat to the Haudenosaunee's fight for recognition. But others, including a team member, said, uh, we fought a battle that year that was bigger than lacrosse because we never did take Canadian or US passports. And then Tonya Fritchner said, we won the games without even having to go to Manchester because there was not a defeat of the passport. And so what are some of the instructive points for this case about the evolving interpretation of indigenous self-determination and also self-determination more broadly? First of all, while we would certainly expect there to be difficulties in acceptance of a Haudenosaunee passport, and I think we could all imagine going up to a border agent and handing this passport, and we could expect there to be questions and difficulties and sometimes not successes. But the key thing here is that the difficulties tend to be more the exception and not the rule. That tells us a lot, because while there are difficulties, and it is always more work and extra work, and I've been at the UN many times when Kenneth Deere has had to get up and do some interventions with the group that had the passports, it's work that uh, the majority of the time results in a recognition and acceptance by a wide variety of states. So while not every state provides a visa on the Haudenosaunee passport, many do, and the, the decision has been if a state does not give a visa, there won't be a trip. And that's just the position. So in that, Haudenosaunee are acting sovereign, making this strong claim of self-determination, but again, stopping short of a full statehood claim as we understand it in the Westphalian system. So the assertion of self-determination is made in a quiet, confident, uniform, and consistent way. And the insistence on traveling on the passport therefore disrupts, challenges how we currently understand an exclusive conception of sovereignty and citizenship. And it's done in ways that countries like the US and the UK are still struggling to accept, because sometimes they'll accept the passport, sometimes they don't. So they're, they're really on the fence about this. But it is the consistency of this Haudenosaunee vision and action that I think gives us a great deal of, of lessons. 
And then on the state side, I think it's quite clear that although there is heavy rhetorical support given uh, by Canada and the UK to support indigenous rights and sometimes the US, there is uh, a struggle and an underlying resistance that we need to pay attention to. And so what we see in the UK and the US case is a lot of switching and, and back and forth and ongoing struggle to accept uh, these heavy sovereign ex assertions. And it is very difficult for states to imagine new and innovative possibilities for plural sovereignty and multi-level citizenship, and they prefer the old, familiar, uh, strict sovereignty constructions. So, fourth, indigenous self-determination is not something that needs to operate solely within the bounds of existing state structures. And as the widespread and fairly routine acceptance of passports can demonstrate, indigenous self-determination can and should exist in plural sovereignty arrangements, in, and it can do so in a manner that doesn't have to disrupt sovereignty of other states. So it's pushing for a very plural conception, and it can be decoupled from how we understand sovereignty. And so my final concluding point is that the right of self-determination remains in an ongoing process of interpretation, reinterpretation, and evolution. And I think indigenous peoples have that responsibility to not only be aware of our rights, but also to think through multiple possibilities of what self-determination can be, and to assert those most multiple possibilities in negotiations. So, in a sense, sharing information with one another to expand the menu of options and, and to share with us uh, what our different choices are so that we can work out different arrangements with states. And so, like Haudenosaunee, who assertively stand by their right to travel on their own passports, I think it's incumbent upon indigenous peoples and nations to think through carefully what our positions are vis-a-vis -vis the constitution of our self-determination and then prepare to assert strongly with the state as the Haudenosaunee to. But we can also expect uh, strong resistance when we present such initiatives. So I'm going to stop there and I think Howard has a few more things to add. So this is our tag team. Andrea was um here this uh, yesterday, and she gave us a couple copies of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And the front cover is a picture of the march that uh, was held in Geneva. And um, right here, the first one is Leon Shenandoah, which is our, um, at the time, our Taro Daho, like the chairman for, the, for our Confederacy of Chiefs. And right behind him, in between these two gentlemen, is is my uncle, Louis Thompson, that went over in 1977. So hopefully I'm continuing his work that he, he started in 1977. And uh, another thing I want to mention too is we are also working on our in enhanced ID card, um, but uh, we're having a little stumbling block because uh, uh, yesterday, uh, yesterday Peter had mentioned that they, um, was it Toto? They have to yeah. Yeah, they have their own ID card, but um, on their ID card, it will say U.S. citizen. So that's our stumbling block is that we're developing a card, but we are not going to have U.S. or Canadian citizenship on it. So that's our stumbling block to be able to get those two states, Canada and U.S., to recognize our card whenever we get it developed. And the other one is, as we mentioned, the Skahe went over um, uh, in 1924. So if you look at it, we're at 2019 and almost into 2020. So we're currently um, working with the city of Geneva to have a 100-year celebration for the time when the Skahe went over, which is just only a few years down the road. So Geneva had recommended we better we better start working working on developing some kind of celebration for that 100 years that that since we um, uh, put indigenous issues on the floor. 
So I think that's uh, all I want to add to it. Um, some of the trial, what you call it, trial and tribulations that this passport goes through. Um, uh, myself, Kenneth Deer, and uh, uh, Betty's partner, Taro Daho, we went to Bolivia. And uh, God, Bolivia gladly accepts us because at the time uh, um, it was President Evo Morales, which is an indigenous person, says, yes, come on down and come, come be, take part in whatever um, we're doing. So we got down there and we took part in this uh, conference that they had. I think it was to get, rid of, to get ready for uh, the, the COP in Paris. COP 21 in Paris, it was to get, to get ready for that. So we, we did our participation in that, but then come time to get on, get on the plane to come home. The airline says, okay, we don't recognize these passports, so we'll call Canada. So the uh, next stop would have been to land in Peru and on our way home. And the uh, consulate in Peru says, those are fantasy documents. I wouldn't let them on the plane. So we were on the plane and we were asked to be, get off the plane. And then the Minister of Trade for Bolivia said, take care of those guys. Because and, and until they, we can find a way to get them home. So um, we worked on it and uh, um, through uh, Betty's uh, friends in with uh, um, Senator Chuck Schumer's office, we were able to get permission to come home through the United States. So when we left the hotel in, uh, I believe it was La Paz, um, the two gentlemen came into the hotel and, pay, and escorted us to their cars. And as we were driving down the road, I was wondering, where's all these flashing lights coming from? Here we were in a police es police car getting an escort right through town, going <laughs> going through red lights and whatnot, and got us to the airport. And um, they took us to the airline and made sure that the airline accepted us. Took us to the customs people and made sure the customs accepted us, and then they left us. So they, they treated us good. And then uh, we landed in Miami since we're coming home through the states. And um, so when the plane lands and stops and everybody jumps up and gets their baggage off the, the, the bulkhead there and then um, they're all standing and waiting for the doors to open and then the pilot comes on the air and he says, will everybody please sit down and will Chiefs Howard Thompson and Chief Sid Hill please come up to the front. <laughs> <laughs> so means uh, Sid Hill are jumping over all of his luggage that's already standing in the aisle there. And the door opens, and we have a, a U.S. Customs officer waiting there for us. He escorted us to his uh, his desk and processed processed us. And 15 minutes later, we were at our next our next flight. Because if we would have got off at the plane, it would take us half an hour to get off the plane, and another 45 minutes to go through customs, and then gotta find the next the next flight. So that was uh, that was an adventure there. But that's just one of the. Um, Adventures we had with our passport. Uh, uh, one of the latest one was uh, in uh, Mexico, Mexico City. We had a, uh, a gathering there to um, to get ready for. I forget what the event was to get ready for. Um, oh, it was a corn corn conference that uh, the indigenous people put on, and it was held in Mexico, outside of Mexico City, in one of the indigenous communities. So when it comes time to come home, um, yeah, I, I went through a different airline and they wouldn't accept my passport. So they called the Canadian Customs in Mexico City and they said, no, I wouldn't let them on the plane. That's a fantasy document they carries. So by this time we have more connections in Ottawa, so our, <laughs> our, our friend Kenneth Deer called the government in Ottawa, customs, and uh, two days later they said, get him on that plane and get him home. So it's, uh, we have our, our trials and tribulations with our passport, but uh, we still can say that we, we, we travel on who we are, and not, the, not our colonized uh, state that we're, that we're in. So I thought that would, I'd add that, a few, a few things. Thank you.
to add one more adventure story. <laughs> this summer uh, in Geneva at the Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous People, Kenneth Deer had brought uh, a whole delegation. How many? Really? Seven, eight people, six, six people, and um, on day two uh, they were supposed to go and get their permanent IDs for the from the UN. Now they had already come in on the one day passes, I believe it was, and so then uh, Kenneth was sitting in the chamber with us, uh, and all of a sudden he got a, a text message on his phone, and he jumped up, grabbed his little Ziploc bag with uh, a whole bunch of documentation and headed out to the front gate because the six were stuck at the front gate of the UN and they wouldn't accept the Haudenosaunee passport as ID to get the, the permanent UN IDs. So Kenneth was gone about, oh, 90 minutes or so, but sure enough, showed back up in the chamber with all six people in hand and they were all wearing their UN IDs. So it's not always easy uh, from what I've seen in, in these cases, and I'm sure Howard could tell us a whole afternoon of stories uh, of the adventures and trials and tribulations. But uh, they were all smiles when they came in because they uh, were able to get those UN IDs with the Haudenosaunee passport. Oh, that's cool. Yes, that is important. Um, one of the, the members of that delegation uh, who I was honored to spend those days with is the name carrier of this guy. And uh, so he was, uh, it was very important that he get that ID card that day. So thank you, Howard. Thank you, uh, Cheryl, uh, for your talk, uh, um, kind of expanding the complexity and plurality of the uh, concept of self-determination and sovereignty, and how, like, kind of using Haudenosaunee passport as an example of, of that complexity. I think that's a great uh, illustration. And also, by doing that, kind of moving us away from discussing boundaries solely through the state-centric understanding, because I think this is something that we have been discussing, but not explicitly, and that's something that uh, uh, we were discussing with Elsa as well when, uh, before uh, getting ready for this conference and, and the concept knowledge and like that, that we need to talk about boundaries also from an indigenous perspective, not just the state boundaries and state-centric uh, uh, perspe perspective. So this is kind of like an excellent illustration of, of like the indigenous, uh, yeah, indigenous uh, view and indigenous uh, um, understanding and indigenous boundaries mm -hmm. and the reality of indigenous boundaries as well and, and how they uh, intersect um, and thank you also for sharing the great uh, uh, the, the many great stories um, but yeah you want to ask I just want to add um, one little thing is um, something that um, Betty's uncle uh, um, faith keeper owner line said one time and I always uh, keep it in mind is sovereignty is the act thereof. So don't, we don't wait on another state, another government to give us our sovereignty. We act sovereign. And that's why we have our own passports and our, our border issues. We constantly give them problems at the border. So um, uh, it's, yeah, it's just, uh, you're the ones that it's sovereign and you have to act and not wait for another state to give it to you. Thank you. Thank you. So we open the uh, floor now for questions. Um, we have about 10 minutes before the coffee break, so the floor is open. Go ahead. And, and please, uh, if you haven't introduced yourself yesterday, please do so. So just you and then... Uh, <coughs> Oh, you, and then uh, you, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ophira. I'd like to study from the United Nations and work with the Department of Political Affairs. Um, a very interesting presentation, um, lots of thoughts, lots of um, questions, but I'm going to try to be synthetic. Um, so one, one question is more like um, in terms of evidence. Like we were talking yesterday a lot about the U.S.-Mexico border, and I just wanted to know about the U.S.-Canada border. I know you touched on this at the beginning of the presentation, but how has this changed? Have you also seen more difficulties to go across, like uh, uh, the, the colleagues mentioned yesterday about the U.S. Mexican border related to you know the political situation? I think there are less tension, but also 
uh, as far as I can understand, that there has been a change you know, on the U.S. Uh, the border. Uh, so that's one question. And then the other question, building a little bit of what was said yesterday and today, um, I hear that in some cases having friends helps, right? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I think it was Betty yesterday who mentioned the shame game works really well. So in that, in that sense, you know, in the case of Geneva, having the mayor they are open to. So, is there a technique? Is there is there a path there to explore further to promote indigenous rights by building those strong relationships with key partners in government? Could be at the local level, could be at the federal level, but I wonder if this is something that um, needs to be explored. Um, and if you have any experience in that. As far as um, local border crossings, um, they've um, accommodated us to some extent without breaking their own rules. So um, we've had problems with, uh, for an example, where I live in Akizasna, because of our, our strength and our determination to not let certain things happen. In Canada, they decided to arm all their customs agents. And where I live, that customs building was on our territory. So we said, you are not going to arm custom agents on our territory. So, they, uh, they shut down the border and wouldn't let nobody across for, I believe it was a month to six weeks. So the determination by Canada was to move their customs building off our territory into the neighboring town. So that was, we, we, we got what we wanted by not being, having armed customs agents on our territory. But now that they left, when I come from the U.S. side, come on to my home, I live on an island, and when I come home, I have to go an extra step and go into the city to go through a customs so I can turn around and come back to go home. So that's just, uh, it's almost like, uh, and a policy, a policy to make us do that was passed in, within Canada's um, legislation system or whatever system they used, and they, they labeled it as across Canada. But, so, but it was meant for us to say that we have to go to that customs to turn around and come home. So that's, a, that's one of the uh, problems that, uh, well, it's, I guess it's a reaction to to something that they wanted to do. And your other question of the, the path of uh, how to, how to certain, how to serve your sovereignty, I guess. And that's still, uh, that's up to individual communities or individual nations of, indigenous nations of how, how they can accomplish that. But it's not going to be easy because we have hard times and we're, uh, we're probably one of the stronger ones to implement sovereignty. In, um, um, other countries will have uh, more problems, more serious problems, because they don't have that um, humanity of caring for those individuals that are going to be in confrontation. It could lead to some people getting killed. But for, for, for us, um, we've... Uh, between Canada and U.S., we have that, that humanity relationship between us and, and the, our uh, colonized states that we, we border. So we've never had anybody get killed over, over our confrontations. But um, I, I know other states ain't that, ain't that caring to, uh, um, to avoid that. So it's always going to be up to the individual indigenous peoples throughout the world of how much they can uh, insert 
some sovereignty, but this um, UN declaration serves as a guideline for all indigenous people of the world. It gives them the tools to be able to try for something rather than um, being uh, suppressed and not being able to, you know, which, which where, that's where it comes in hand. Um, a tool is to use is the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues to be able to bring your issues uh, f forward so that it can be looked at and um, so other states can get involved and say, and as Betty would say, shame them into uh, doing the right thing. So that's one of the avenues that, uh, that's, that's been created so that other indigenous people in other countries can have some level of sovereignty or humanity to kick in. Thank you. And I'll go ahead and add some thoughts to that from my part of the border. Uh, things have changed a lot. Uh, I mentioned this in my opening remarks yesterday that when I was uh, a child in the 70s and the 80s, we would cross all the time the border and hardly even notice it was there. And sometimes there was nobody even at the border to, to ask us questions. Other times they would just stop and say, where do you hold citizenship, where do you live, where are you headed, and it would be a very quick interaction. And in those days, my brother-in-law crossed the border routinely. He would hunt on the other side, he'd fish on the other side, ceremonies on the other side, because half our relatives are uh, on either side of the border. 9-11 changed everything. Now there's always a guard there, now they ask more questions, and as time went by, now you need a passport or an enhanced tribal ID card in order to cross the border. Consequently, my brother-in-law doesn't do it very often anymore because he shows up and gives his tribal ID card and doesn't go and then waits for his family to come back. Um, so it's gotten a lot more difficult and every time I'm there I think at that at that land crossing I think about Europe and I think about how they've managed to open borders within Europe while well, at the same time that we've been closing them in North America and how wrong that feels um, especially for those of us who live transporter. It, it's a very big thing. Uh, in terms of your second question, this is actually something I've been spending a lot of time recently thinking about. And some of it stems from the interviews I've done in the past, well, it's getting to be eight, nine years now, on the passport issue. And how much of that involves negotiation, quiet diplomacy, small acts of diplomacy, small acts of sovereignty, repeated over and over and over again. And how each one of those small acts in the end adds up to something big. And uh, one of my interviewees said, you know, when we get to a place with our passport, we don't hold a big press conference and say, gosh, it worked. <laughs> it just, you keep doing it. You go to Bolivia, you go to Mexico, you find a way back, and each one of those acts builds a case. And what I've been observing in Canada, particularly recently, and this is where I'm doing some new thinking about your second question, um, and I know the Trudeau government gives, gets a bad rap, and I'm usually one of the first to um, start calling out what they haven't done. <laughs> but I'm also observing something that is a series of these small acts of diplomacy and negotiation and relationship building that has started to happen. Um, and, and I've seen it both at the federal level and there's been a distinct change from the previous government, the Harper government, where it didn't talk to us at all. Uh, this government, uh, when we're in New York, when we're in Geneva, they invite us to the mission. Uh, we sit and we talk about issues in that space. And while we don't disagree and we call them out and we shame them on certain things, there is a conversation happening. And it isn't just in, in the UN spaces. They're inviting us in in meetings in Ottawa and consulting us more and more in small ways that added up means something bigger. And then most recently in British Columbia, this legislation that was just tabled 
was not just the province. It was the province working with indigenous leadership, sitting down, discussing, negotiating, and co-developing the legislation that was then presented in a joint way uh, and consulted on in a joint way, and then on the floor of this assembly was presented jointly in ways that had completely disrupted the way that parliamentary British-style business is usually done in British Columbia. And it was really a wonderful day to, to watch and to see. And again, I think it's all these small changes and small steps added up and their relationship building and its conversations and it's repeated and there's an openness. And it just might be leading us to something new. Uh, and so this is an idea that I'm cooking right now about co-development and, and new styles of, of negotiating. And, and that is actually a declaration grounded idea that we would sit down and have conversations about difficult issues. So while I'm one of our government's chief critics, um, I'll also give credit where credit is due and I'm perhaps seeing some small steps, uh, at least initially. And I hope it lasts uh, in the right direction. <laughs>